The first speaker is Victor Janke. He will speak about Krylov complexity in free and interacting QFT. Please, 45 minutes. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's, uh, let me first thank the organizers for the opportunity to, to give this talk. It's a pleasure to participate in this workshop again. So yeah, so this is based on a recent work in collaboration with Ugo, uh, Ugo Kamargyu, uh, Mitsuhiro Nishida, and Kyunyun Kim. Uh, yeah, so let's just start. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so recently, uh, the study of many-body quantum chaos has gained considerable attention, uh, in, in part because of this uncovered connection uh, with black hole physics. And of course, there are several approaches to diagnose quantum chaos, for instance, level space statistics, out of time order correlators, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. However, despite some recent progress, it's not super clear how these different manifestations of quantum chaos are connected or if there is a unifying notion of quantum chaos. And in this work, we discuss uh, a new notion of quantum chaos known as Krylov complexity. So, yeah, so why study K complexity? I, I'm going to abbreviate Krylov complexity and, and refer to it as K complexity. So, K complexity is a notion of operator grow that provides a useful diagnosis of quantum chaos in lattice systems. So it has uh, connections with other notions of quantum chaos. It's well-defined and relatively easy to compute. And it also has a version for states that is called state, comp uh, state of complexity that might have some qualitative agreement with some holographic proposals for quantum complexity. So in this work in particular, we study the properties of K-complexity for free and interacting uh, QFTs. So why study K-complexity in QFTs? Like, although Krylov complexity has been studied for CFTs and other systems with a higher uh, degree of symmetry, it has not been studied for more general QFTs. So to go beyond the symmetry-dependent scenarios, we study uh, Krylov complexity uh, when we break conformal symmetry, for example, considering a massive scalar field, when we introduce a UV cutoff, and also for interacting QFTs. Uh, okay, so so yeah, so let's start discussing the notion of operator growth. So if you start with the Heisenberg operator, uh, you can write the solution for the Heisenberg operator formally in this way. And you can, if you expand the exponentials, you can write the Heisenberg operator as the sum of nested commutators. And in general, these nested commutators give rise to, to terms which are more and more complicated. So to be precise, let's consider, for example, the example of a spin chain. So if you consider a spin chain, like the one shown here, uh, let's say you have like some operator Z1 acting on the first side. So as you consider the Heisenberg evolution, uh, these terms involving nested commutators, they become more and more important. And as you consider more and more, as you commute Z1 with the Hamiltonian more and more times, you get terms which are more complicated. Uh, for, for instance, Z1 initially acts only on the first side, but after commuting Z1 with the Hamiltonian, for example, four times, you get terms that act on the second side and terms that act uh, on the third side uh, and so on. So the, under time evolution, this operator becomes more and more uh, complicated. So what's the idea? Like so, this these nested commutators they they provide some sort of basis in which you can expand your operator, and it's a perfectly fine basis. However, uh, to precisely quantify how this operator is growing, uh, it's more useful to define uh, a basis which is orthonormal. So the idea here is to introduce a notion of inner product between operators, and then you define a, a basis which is orthonormal according to this inner product. And that, that's the basic idea of the Krylov basis. Instead of using this basis, you just use a gran schmidt orthonormalization procedure to define an orthonormal basis. 
So to discuss this in more abstract terms, uh, the basic idea here, you first you'll define this operator L, which is the Liouvillian. And then you can write the time evolved operator formally in this way. Um, and of course, if you expand the exponential, you can write this as a sum involving this operator O tilde K, which is uh, defined here. So this set of operators, O tilde K, defines the so-called uh, Krilov space associated to the operator O. So starting from this basis, which is in general not orthogonal, we use the so-called Lanczos algorithm to construct an orthonormal basis. And this orthonormal basis is the Krilov basis. Uh, in this process, it's very important also to consider uh, at the central object in this algorithm is a two-point function, which I call C, and it's defined here. And usually this whole story makes sense in the context of thermal systems. So beta here is denotes the inverse of the temperature, and the context to, uh, these things will be computed in the context of thermal systems. May I ask yeah. uh, some uh, simple questions? Suppose you are doing uh, calculations with Ising model in external and external field as it's presented in your example. So I assume that you have, for example, 10, 10 sites, something. To construct okay. this uh, uh, orthogonal, uh, orthogonal basis, do you need to use cluster or you can use uh, just Mathematica in notebook? You, you can do in Mathematica. You can Mathematica, do Mathematica. yes. Uh -huh, yeah, I, with Mathematica, I think you can go up to perhaps 12 or 14 sites, if you wait. Ah, 12 or 14, uh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, thank but you. to do it quickly, like in a few seconds, 10 sites, uh, it works fine, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, uh, okay, so thank you for the question. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, okay. So, yeah, as I told you, like this C of T is the two point function, and everything we are going to extract from this two point function, uh, and for, given an operator, right? So, let's go ahead. So yeah, so we first we regard the operator as a state in a Hilbert space of operators, and then we define this inner product. So here is the the so-called like uh, uh, Whiteman inner product, which is defined at a finite temperature. But normally people consider, for example, this inner product for for instance an infinite temperature, where beta is zero. But once you define this inner product, uh, you can just uh, construct your orthonormal basis, just following a uh, standard uh, Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization procedure. So as you do this, you if you follow this algorithm, you you find this basis, this Krilov basis, which is orthonormal. And as you do this, uh, there are some coefficients, Bn, which are called Lanczos coefficients, and they are super important. And they are basically uh, given here in this expression. They are basically your basis before you normalize the basis. Those are the Lanczos coefficients. Yeah, so as you proceed. Um, so yeah, so then like we want to solve the Heisenberg equation of motion. So in this formalism, the Heisenberg equation of motion basically takes the form of a Schrodinger equation, where instead of the Hamiltonian, you have the Liouvillian. And if you basically write uh, the operator in the Krilov basis, doing an expansion here as in equation two, uh, the Liouvillian takes in this in the, in the Krilov basis, you will notice that the Liouvillian takes a very simple form, uh, which is here in the equation three. It's basically a three diagonal matrix, and and if you use equations two and three, uh, two uh, two and three in in equation one, you will find this equation in the last line, which is basically a discretized version of, of the quant of the Schrodinger equation, where these phi ends here, they sort of have the interpretation of a wave function. And they are defined here above, they are basically uh, overlaps of the Krilov of your operator with uh, fixed terms in the Krilov basis, with individual terms in the Krilov basis. Uh, so they have this interpretation, and depending on how you define things, you can you can make the sum of these wave functions to be one. So they are sort of like normalized in this way. And so in the end of the story, you will start trying to solve the Heisenberg equation of motion. 
And in the end, you get this uh, 1D quantum mechanical problem, uh, which is uh, perhaps simpler. And the interpretation here is that you have basically like a particle in a one dimensional chain, which people call a Krilov chain. In, in this interpretation, like uh, as the particle moves through the chain, it's basically the particle is accessing more and more uh, complicated terms um, in the Krilov basis. So the particle moves through the chain, um, assessing more and more terms in the Krilov basis. And as you see from this expression in the first line, uh, the BNs, the Lankrus coefficients, they have here the interpretation of hopping amplitudes. So they basically control the probability of the particle to move through the chain. Also, having this picture in mind, uh, Parker and collaborators, they define the Krilov complexity, which is given in this expression. And this is, this is basically the average position of the particle along the chain. That's the interpretation. And, oh yeah, so before, so yeah, so the basic idea here is that if you have like a chaotic system, like uh, this BNs will be, will grow pretty quickly and the particle will move uh, through this chain and we'll have access to more and more complicated operators in the in the Krilov basis. Uh, so yeah, so so here, like, as you see, like to, to, to solve this problem, it's like you have basically a, a recursion relation here and uh, the starting point of your recursion relation is phi zero. Phi zero is basically your two point function that I defined it, uh, in the beginning. And if you have like phi zero, you can compute phi one. And if you have phi one, you can compute phi two having phi zero and phi one and so on. So there is another way of solving this problem, which is basically you can do the same thing like, but in, in frequency space. You define for this spectral power, which is the Fourier transform of your two-point function. And from once you have this, this spectral power, you can compute these moments uh, in the first line. And they are basically given by this integral. So if you have these moments, there is an algorithm to, to go from the moments to the to the Lankrus coefficients. So basically, what I'm telling you here is that the following quantity is the two-point function, the two-point function in frequency space the moments or the Lankrus coefficients all provide equivalent ways to describe the dynamics. And sometimes it's more useful to, to, to do things in frequency space. Uh, okay. So yeah, so uh, what Parker and collaborators observe is that in chaotic systems, the Lankrus coefficients, uh, they grow as fast as possible. And that means linear growth. And what they observe is that if the Lankrus coefficients grow linearly, e, and under a few more assumptions, you can prove that Krill of complexity grows exponentially. Uh, this should be compared to the case of integrable or free theories in which the Lankrus coefficients, they either do not grow much or they grow like following some sort of power law where delta here, for example, is smaller than, than one. So yeah, so they observe this feature. So they, they, they propose, um, of complexity as a way to characterize this chaotic behavior. So, but one should be careful here because what they say is that uh, in the paper is that if the system is chaotic, you get this linear behavior. But they don't say that if you get the linear behavior, then the system is chaotic. So uh, chaos implies linear behavior, but linear behavior does not imply chaos. It's not like a if and only if condition. Uh, and they are careful enough in the paper about that. So yeah, any any questions so far? Okay. So yeah, so in the if you go as I told you, sometimes it's convenient to to see things from the point of view of the frequency space. So in this this maximal possible growth of the Lanczos coefficients is equivalent to the slowest possible decay of the power spectrum. And the lower this lowest possible decay of the power spectrum turned out to be this exponential behavior. This was demonstrated by Abanning and collaborators a few years ago. And I yeah, have so a question. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um this uh, maximal growth does not rely on any assumption of uh, locality of the Hamiltonian. 
Ah, okay, good question. Um, what they, I think they sort of implicitly assume is that this two point function sort of goes to zero at late times. Uh, I'm not so sure if there is any sort of locality assumption. I, I don't think so because yeah, I don't. I, I I'm not so sure, but I don't think it. It you won't have to assume this. As far as I know, but I, I could be wrong about that. Yeah, so I, I think it's quite general. Does that answer your okay. question? Or... Yeah, I guess. Uh, yes, and just this uh, from the point of view of the spin chain. Uh, in yeah. the of uh, chain. There wouldn't be anything wrong with uh, having a larger than n uh, growth. Or uh, can you see from no, this sorry. point of view that it would be not it would not be possible? No, sorry. Could you repeat your question, please? Uh, so you convert the problem into this uh, spin chain, uh, right? In the ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and from from this point of view, is is there something obviously wrong with having a faster than linear growth of the coefficients. Something wrong? Like, sorry, I, I am not sure if I yeah, understand. Some, well, something inconsistent or uh, why why is it not possible that they grow faster than linear? Ah, okay. Yeah, so I think what, uh, the argument that Parker and collaborators give, it's actually based on this uh, paper by Abani. They, what they show is that the linear, so basically they show that in uh, in lattice systems, like the, the 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 power spectrum should decay faster than exponential, but you can mathematically translate this this behavior to to the Langshus coefficient, and it turns out to be like uh, to to be linear, but it's it's more like a mathematical relation, like the similar statements either in frequency or in or in the space of this Kirillov Kirillov chain. But uh, you, do you think it should be possible to have growth bigger than the linear? That's your your comment. Well, I don't know. Um, yes, I was just know, yeah. I mean, like for example, in the SYK, for example, you get a linear behavior, and in in chaotic models, in chaotic spin chains, in general, you get this linear behavior. But I don't know. Perhaps in some unusual model, you could get something uh, a stronger growth but uh, apparently yeah, for this example, follows this, this uh, triple scale limit of SYK which is supposed to be hyper uh, ah, hyper fast yeah, uh, yeah, that I, yeah that, that's a good question that that I don't know if people have computed yet if if they have the result for the two point function it's easy to see if it grows quicker than than linearly but apparently what parker says is that you have this statement in frequency space and this implies that it should be at most linear. So that's like the one statement that they, they make in their paper. But I think it's possible that with some unusual example, perhaps you can violate this. But uh, yeah, anyways. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much for your question. Uh, so yeah. So yes, yeah, so what? So this is interesting because, like, what Parker and collaborators did, like, they showed at, at, infinite, at infinite temperature, they showed that. Uh, so, so yeah, so two alpha here. So I told you before that Kirillov complexity grows exponentially, and the exponent is two alpha, where alpha here is basically the the parameter that controls the linear growth of the BN. So two alpha, it's the Krilov exponent, let's say. So what they show in their paper is that the Lyapunov, if there is a Lyapunov exponent, it should be bounded by the so-called Krilov exponent, let's say. So I think this is like what make makes the proposal interesting because it connects with a different notion of, of quantum chaos, which is provided by this uh, OTOCs. And there is also some evidence that the bound remains valid at finite temperature. Uh, the Marsky and collaborators, for example, they propose this bound here, written in the 
sex, which would be like the, the, the chaos bound, let's say, and the Lyapunov exponent uh, should be smaller than, than the Krilov exponent. Yeah, so... Yeah, so here I have a comment about what happens if you have finite dimensional Hubert space. So usually, uh, in, initially in the paper by Parker, they consider the thermodynamic limit. So they consider systems which are very big. Uh, however, if you have a system in which the Hubert space, space is, is finite, then what happens is that initially the, the Lanczos coefficients, they grow linearly. And as they grow linearly, no, I mean, like, considering that they grow linearly, for example, if you have a, a chaotic system, for example, So they grow linearly, and the but then because of the Lanczos coefficient rate, and once it grows uh, linearly in time instead of exponentially. So in general, like if you take like a spin chain with just like ten sides, you will not be able to even see this linear behavior, or oh no, the linear behavior perhaps you can see, but not the exponential growth because the system saturates too quickly and you only observe this linear growth, which is typical of systems which are not in, in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, yeah, so this is just a comment. So yeah, so what happens if you consider QFTs? So in QFTs, uh, we, we are going to be using this two-point function, right? So, so let's say the time, real time runs horizontally, but you also have the Euclidean time going around the circle. So if you, you, you can see from this expression, for example, that at time equals i beta over two, the two operators will be placed on the same point. So in, in Q, uh, usually this doesn't happen, for example, in, in the spin chain. If you put the two operators on the same point, you just get some constant. But in, in QFTs, this, this always diverges. So that basically implies that the, the two-point function is analytic in some strip in the complex T plane. And if you compute the Fourier transform, you basically see that the power spectrum decays uh, exponentially as a consequence of this pole. So this immediately implies that the Lanczos coefficients grow linearly and, and correspondingly, the Krilov complexity grows exponentially. And yes, yeah, so that's a, a bit, uh, yes, there, is there a question? Yeah, so the, the, so basically this implies that in QFTs, you always get linear behavior and you always get this exponential increase of K complexity. So this is a bit disappointing because it means like it, the kill of complexity is not, has nothing to do, or the, it doesn't has, it doesn't have much to say about chaos in the case of QFTs. Although perhaps this is not uh, too surprising because it's kind of hard to define chaos in QFTs. I mean, like you can use OTOCs to define chaos in QFTs at large N, because in this case you get some exponential growth of OTOCs. But if you're not in the large N, then it's it's very hard to think about chaos in QFTs. For example, you could think about like level space statistics, but in QFTs the spectrum is is continuous. So how do you define this level spacing, for example. And in fact, uh, uh, Dimarski and Smoking, they studied Krilov complexity for two-dimensional CFTs, and they found that the, the BN, they found this universal behavior for BN. They always grow linearly, and correspondingly, the Krilov complexity always grows exponentially, regardless of the CFT. So this is basically giving you uh, some sort of like counter example to, to the folklore that you could use um, of complexity to, to characterize chaos in any system. It turns out that it works really well um, in lattice systems, but in QFTs, uh, since you always get this linear behavior and this exponential behavior, uh, it's not super useful to, to characterize any sort of um, chaotic behavior. But uh, if you consider large N theories, then you can make some statements about chaos for sure. Yeah, so yeah, so we consider we we didn't consider uh, models at large n, but uh, 
we, we plan to do this in the future. But just to start, we consider uh, a simple case of a massive scalar field in the dimensions. So with this type of uh, Lagrangian. So basically, we study the effects of mass, ultraviolet cutoff, and interactions on the on the Lanxious coefficients and Clil of complexity. And in the end, we will be able to make a statement about chaos, even though we are in the context or in the framework of, of, of uh, QFTs. And so, yeah, so what's the strategy? So basically, uh, for QFTs, for us, it turned out to be more convenient to first compute the two-point function in frequency space. And once you have the two-point function in frequency space, we the two-point function in, in, as a function of time. But in frequency space, you can easily get the moments by just computing some integrals. Uh, and from the moments, there is a, a way to get the Lanxious coefficients. So once you, you get the Lanxious coefficients in phi zero, you can just solve the Schrodinger equation recursively, and you get all the wave functions. And finally, you can compute uh, Krill of complexity. Yeah, and I ask no, another question. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, if you go back to this result of, um, of the universality of into this EFT, Yes. Sure, sure. Uh, could it be related to the fact that because the Hamiltonian is um, uh, part of the conformal group, uh, you just see the, the same conformal family of the operator you start with? I think for, for the CFT, it could be. But I think you can make like a general argument for any QFTs um, mm -hmm. that they should be um, for any QFTs, you can make this general argument that uh, you always get this linear growth based on the fact that the two-point function diverges as you point, point the two operators on the same position. Uh, uh, so I think, like, yeah, you can you don't even need to make it much many assumptions. Like, uh, you just consider general QFTs. You can you can sort of make a make a convincing argument that this should always be the case. Uh, but in in in, in two dimensional CFTs, like what they do, like they start with a two point function, and they use the so called Toda method to get the, the Krill of complexity. And so, uh, let me think. So yeah, I think like as long as long as you use like scalar operators with like scaling dimension delta, you get always the same result. But perhaps there is like a deeper reason, like. Uh, for, for this universal behavior, specifically in the case of, of two-dimensional CFTs. And uh, perhaps you're right, but I I, I I I cannot really say for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Yeah, okay, so yeah, so that's the idea. So how do we get the spectral function, the power spectral in, in QFTs? So in QFT is like basically we are going to consider this uh, Whiteman two point function defined in this way in the first line, and this Whiteman two point function is related to the so called spectral density, which is defined here, and it's basically given by the the Fourier form of this uh, expectation value of this commutator, and it turns out that in in free theory you can actually compute this spectral density. So this is like a standard textbook uh, result of um, thermal field theory textbook result of, for the spectral density. It takes this uh, relatively simple form. And once you have the spectral density, you can you can compute your white your Whiteman function. Uh, so we start with the free theory just to 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 as a warm up. So yeah, so once you, you have the spectral, then you can compute the spectral power by computing this integral. And you, you we were able to get this um, analytic result for the spectral power. So once you have the analytic result, it's easy to compute the moments and just run the algorithm. algorithm. Um, and of course, like if you just full here transform, you get the autocorrelation, which is like the initial two point function. It's a bit complicated, like these functions are kind of messy, but it takes this, uh, this form here. So yeah, so let me show you the results now. So yeah, so those are the results for the Lanxious coefficients as a function of n. So what we observe 
uh, is that the main effect of, of having a mass, the, the mass breaks conformal invariance. So the mass basically divides the, the Lankros coefficients into two families, one for even and other for odd values of n. And uh, Dimarski refers to these effects as staggering. So uh, we were able to derive some analytic formulas for the Lankros coefficients, which uh, describe the results approximately for, describe the results for, for small values of n. And basically here, uh, what we observe is that the, the difference here between the odd and even coefficients is basically given by the mass. If you increase the mass, you increase this distance. So this has some interesting effects um, in the Krill of complexity. Uh, if you plot the Krill of complexity, this is like a log scale. So a linear behavior here means the Krill of complexity is growing exponentially. So as you consider uh, increasing values of mass, what you observe is that this Krill of exponent uh, decreases. So we ex we basically write the Krill of complexity uh, in this exponential form, and we use some time window to extract this exponent. And we basically observe that this exponent decreases as, as you increase the mass. So of exponent as a function of mass, and you can see that it decreases. I have some a few additional results, which I, I don't think I have much time to, to discuss. Yeah, so th this effect is it's kind of interesting. It, it will have important consequences later on. Uh, uh, yes, so we also consider uh, this idea of introducing a UV cutoff. Our idea here was try to model what would be if we put the theory on a lattice, for example. So we just put this UV cutoff to see what type of effect this has on the on, on the Langtros coefficients. And the, the UV cutoff basically put forever. Like here, uh, I, I show the results for an infinite UV cutoff and for a finite UV cutoff. And you can see basically that the UV cutoff produces a saturation. Uh, okay, so of course, like if you produce a saturation, then uh, as a result, the Krill of complexity doesn't grow exponentially anymore, but it grows linearly. And that's what we show here. Yeah. So this is similar to the behavior observed by, by Dimarski and Smoking in their paper. So they, but they, they did it differently. Instead of like introducing a they already started with a, with a free theory on a lattice, and they observed similar uh, results of interactions. So we consider um, this type of interact interaction term with L equals 3, in which case this would be like a relevant deformation, and L equals 4. So the, the idea here is like we first compute the one-loop self-energy, then we use an analytic continuation to determine the one loop correction to this to, to the power spectrum. Uh, yeah, so let me show you the results. Look, first consider the five part theory. So, so in the five part theory, we consider this type of of, of loop, and and like so, the, the, summing all types of uh, this one part co reducible diagrams, we can see that the the propagator changes from from in this particular way. And ba basically what this tells you is that this um, one loop diagrams, they basically introduce a thermal mass in the system. So the, the mass just changes in this way. So for instance, here, this thermal mass, if the initial mass is zero, the thermal mass just scales with the temperature square, for example. And basically, so if you have like zero mass, then you have like conformal field theory and you have like no staggering. You have basically this smooth curve of Lanthus coefficients. But if the theory, if you put interactions, then the theory uh, has this, acquires this thermal mass and this thermal mass will basically produce staggering. Uh, so yeah, so for the case of the, by three theory, the, 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 we consider this type of, of. Unfortunately, in this case, we had to do everything numerically for zero mass, 
And the, the effect is kind of similar. We also observe some sort of store results. This is just like a cartoon of the results because this effect is actually very small. But we basically observe staggering, but it's a staggering that decreases as you increase n. And eventually, you see no staggering if you uh, produce similar effects. But for the five four theory, it's a constant staggering. And for the five three theory, it's a decreasing staggering. Uh, and this, this, is, this staggering properties can be traced back to the properties of the power spectrum. Uh, yeah, so those are the, the, the main effects of interactions. So, so yeah, so we, we, we uh, here we basically, I don't know how much, how much time do I have? Perhaps I still have like 10 minutes, but uh, yeah, so basically we, here we like, we try to figure out what type of conditions you have to uh, impose on the spectral power, on the power spectrum for the absence of staggering. And we come up with a few conditions. I, I don't, I think this is maybe uh, too technical or too, too many details to discuss, but so I'm going to skip this slides. So, so the main lessons that we learned from, from, this, from this study is that first, like the, the mass divides the Lancros coefficients into two families and decreases the growth rate of K-complexity. So the UV cutoff produces, produces a saturation and the K-complexity changes his, its behavior from exponential to linear. Uh, quartic interactions introduce an effective thermal mass, which produces a staggering and decreases the, the Grilov exponent. And cubic interactions produces a staggering effects that uh, reduce as we increase n. So our results are, are consistent with, with the ones uh, published by Avtorsky, Demarski, and Smoking. So perhaps like to the, the, the main lesson is that previously, if you just consider like a CFT, for example, you have no staggering, you have just a single, so you have this smooth curve of, of, of Lanczos coefficients as a function of n. And in this case, the slope of this curve basically gives you the Krilov exponent. And yeah, so and you get the, and you get basically you get the, this this Krilov exponent equals two to two pi times t, or, or which is like its maximum value. So for any QFT, for any QFTs. Uh, however, what we observe here is that once you introduce a staggering, like if there is if the curve is not really smooth then what you get is like a, a Krilov exponent, which is uh, is smaller than two alpha. So for, for QFTs, the, uh, the, the Krilov, this two alpha will always be, so it is basically smaller than two pi times t. So the, this this result is not as universal as we initially thought, like the curve of Lanczos coefficient, we always have this slope to alpha, but the Krilov exponent can be much smaller. So that basically suggests that you can find configurations in which this bound on the Lyapunov exponent would would be non-trivial. Uh, in our case, we we're basically dealing with QFTs uh, which have zero Lyapunov exponent. So in our particular case, this is not so interesting. But however, if we consider uh, large n matrix models. In these models, uh, if you include interactions, then you have a non-zero Lyapunov exponent. And our analysis suggests that you also have um, a Krilov exponent, which is smaller than the chaos bound. So basically, in large N-matrix models, our analysis suggests that this bound would be non-trivial. And I think that's the main lesson that we learned from, from our paper. So just to, to summarize, uh, yeah, so our results for the Phythor theory suggest that the late time growth of K-complexity decreases with the coupling. And I think it would be interesting to check if this feature is also present in the matrix Phythor theory. Uh, all indicates that it would be also present. And in this case, uh, one can basically so basically, you can say more than the sharper bound on, on chaos, but it would not be so universal. So you would.
would sort of depend on the model. So yeah, I think that we observe a constant staggering, while for relevant deformation, the staggering decreases with n. So if you look at the definitions, you see that the, the luxurious coefficients, they have dimensions of energy. So large n means like large energy. So this is basically telling you that this relevant deformation is less and less important as you go to higher and higher energies. So uh, this sort of has this interpretation. It's kind of consistent with the idea that the relevant deformation would not be important in the UV. But I think uh, it would be interesting to, to further investigate these features in other models. So yeah, I think that's that's all I want to say. So thank you very much for your attention and for the questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your very instructive talk.